Day edition. Um, we are uh, presenting you with a webinar today on the environmental and operational effects of stay at home. Uh, we've been forced into this situation, but what we've learned is that there are some lessons that are coming out of this that are reshaping the way that we can look at our environment, that are changing the way that we're doing business, and that may actually move us into a place uh, or more cognizant of all these things for the future. We got a great panel for you today. And one thing I wanted to do <clears throat> before going any further is just thanking the sponsors that make this happen. We could not do this without the support of these sponsors, Google, the WW Reynolds Company, the Zayo Group, and our partners at Boulder Transportation Connections, who will also be a panelist today, are the folks that make things like this possible. They've um, shown their commitment time and time again to allow us to host events like this, but also to support all the work we're doing on behalf of our uh, members and for all of you. So with that being said, um, today we're gonna go into a program that's also gonna include a message from our president and CEO, John Tayer, on everything the chamber has done for you uh, during this period. We have a really good panel of, um, of folks that I'm gonna introduce after John's message. And then we'll go into questions and answers. And one thing I'd like to remind everyone, uh, in case we haven't done it for you already, as the, the meeting has, please mute, mute your mics and um, we can unmute you if, if need be. But also we'll be taking questions today through the question and answer feature uh, on this webinar. So please submit all of your questions and answers through that, as well as, um, you know, feel free to use the chat, but I'll be looking to the Q and A's uh, in between presenters, but we'll try to save everything for, for after those presentations. So once again, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have quite a number of people that are on here today. And right now I would like to turn it over to our chamber president, uh, CEO, John Tear. And I told them we have a lot to get through today, John. So please be brief in your in your comments, but really hit the highlights of what the Boulder Chamber has been doing during this period of uh, stay at home and during COVID. Thank you, Andrea. You know, I'll just say that I um, I hate when Andrea tells me I have to cut my comments, keep my comments short, because I have so much to tell you. But no, I, I understand that uh, we have a lot of important information to share and to celebrate. Uh, it is the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, and I just love that we have such an outstanding turnout of business leaders to uh, hear the information from our presenters, but also just to demonstrate the commitment that our businesses here in Boulder have to uh, the, the environmental sustainability principles. Uh, you know, 50 years, I was saying, is almost as old as I am, um, but I will say that it's um, so gratifying to see that we are here today celebrating something that has had such a significant uh, benefit for our universe, for the planet that we live on. And, and the irony is that we celebrate this 50 year anniversary at a time when we are dealing with a circumstance that is a challenge also um, for our, our global community. And there's no way that we're gonna get through this um, other than by working together. And the parallel is very similar when you think about the environmental challenges that we face um, globally. So um, with that, I just do wanna transition just quickly to talk about uh, what we have been doing as the Boulder Chamber on behalf of the business community, but also the community at large uh, to help us get through this challenging period. And I'll just summarize it by saying that we've been focused on three things for our businesses. First, information, making sure that we're uh, providing the, the tools that our businesses need to understand the circumstances that we're in and how to respond. Second, uh, financial resources. That's absolutely critical as, as our businesses are struggling they need us to help them identify financing, either just to keep their operations sustained or, uh, or, and or um, to help them maintain um, a, a platform for their, their recovery. 
And then um, third is advocacy on behalf of businesses through this period. So just uh, to touch on each of them, information, resource, we have set up our site, the boulderchamber.com website, to be the center of business information for our businesses, for the community, and your workforce. So I urge you to go to boulderchamber.com. You'll find there in all different categories, everything from information about the status of the COVID and circumstance to where you can identify support services and financing resources um, to help for your employees and, and staff teams. So boulderchamber.com. In addition, um, in partnership with all of the other business um, uh, support organizations, I uh, think the Convention and Visitors Bureau, Downtown Boulder, the Latino Chamber, um, Small business, business Development Center and the City of Boulder, we have put together a page, a resource page on Facebook. It's called the Boulder Area United Business Response Group. That's where you can go to see where there are resources that are being offered, either steep discounts or free for businesses, um, as well as the opportunity for you to post needs that you have during this time and to connect you with folks who can uh, address those resource needs. So really important information sources. And I can tell you, it's, it's a simple to describe, but very complex when you think about all the resources that are out there and, and trying to call them and make sure that they're effective for our businesses. Second, financial resources. Uh, we have been working very hard with the Small Business Administration officials and our local um, Small Business Development Center to make sure that we are advocating for business resources, but making sure that then when they come to our, uh, or become available, that we are making it as easy as possible for our businesses to connect to those resources. Think the Paycheck Protection Program and the EIDL grant. Uh, other programs that are coming online now as the, uh, the congressional leadership starts to bring those resources to, to bear. So we have been working um, to make sure that we're assisting you through that effort. We've talked to every lending institution in our community to make sure we know what they're offering in terms of support and, and services to our businesses to get those resources. And we're updating that list. That's online at the boulderchamber.com website as well. So make sure that uh, we're, you know, you're connecting with those resources, but um, we know that we are working very hard to make sure to get those resources and dollars to you. In addition, uh, you may have heard that we stood up with, uh, in collaboration with the Community Foundation, the Small Business um, Relief Fund. And I just want to say, first of all, we had um, a generous contribution from the city of Boulder right off the bat, but I got to thank our business leadership, and in particular, the Zayo Group um, and the Caruso Foundation provided critical catalyst funding for that, uh, that, that relief fund, and it has been enormously valuable for our businesses. We have closed the application period, but we're now um, going through the process of distributing those resources and just want to thank um, both the City of Boulder uh, officials who are on the line, but also the Zayo uh, group in particular. And then we had other businesses um, follow along and, and, and demonstrate their commitment, in particular Google, um, also a sponsor of this event along with Zayo. Um, we had Twitter come to the table. Um, we've had the Brad and Amy Fel um, Amy Bradfeld and Amy Batchelor, so significant business support to address small business needs through the Relief Fund and, and excited to, to get those resources out to the, the community. Um, and then third, advocacy. And I'll just say that um, in, in, that, uh, in that line that we have been working with our congressional, our Senate leadership, um, our local state delegation officials to partner with them in getting resources out to our business leadership. And, and you know, we have just a, a, a strong, solid connection here um, in partnership with our elected leadership. We're very fortunate in Boulder County. They are leaders and they are folks who speak on our behalf. So we have been working with them in collaboration with the city of Boulder. Um, letters, 
direct conversation and advocacy on behalf of business interests. And then at the local level, making sure that we're representing businesses um, with their specific needs. Uh, as soon as those regulations, for example, on being able to uh, sell alcohol um, uh, drinks off premise uh, were issued by the state, we made sure that our local leadership was, was uh, allowing for that locally. So just really important things. Um, and for our businesses, but just all the way along the line, being a voice for business interests. So that is um, what we've been doing. And I'll just close by saying that I've, I've been um, uh, eager to get to this point, which is, as I say, it's, it's the end of the beginning. Um, we are through the initial response period. And that doesn't mean that we don't have to be protective of Health. We need to be continually vigilant, as our governor says, and our local officials, because we don't want to go backwards. But at the same time, we can start to have the conversation about recovery. And that's certainly a, a brighter light at the end of the tunnel to start thinking about how do we open up businesses in a responsible and safe manner, but one that helps everybody get back to work. So you can know that we are going to be active on behalf of, of all of our business leaders in helping to advance that forward. Again, safety, safety is definitely a priority, but we also need to make sure that we get folks back to work and businesses open. So we'll be working on that end. So I'll just hand it back to the rest of the group by just saying, happy Earth Day. Um, we have urgent issues that we need to address in the current term with COVID, but there's no question that as this uh, turnout for this program demonstrates, we all recognize that we have urgency around addressing our environmental issues. Um, and just as with COVID, it's gonna take collaboration of public, private uh, interests to make sure that we are successful in achieving our environmental goals. So um, I look forward to the program and, and thank our speakers for, for joining us today. Thank you, John. And um, I just want to be able to introduce our panel today because we have a very diverse panel of folks that are involved in very different um, aspects of this uh, stay at home period. First up today, we will have Mike Silverstein, who's the Executive Director of the Regional Air Quality Council. And Mike will be um, discussing simple steps for better air, but first and foremost, what are we seeing right now as far as air quality, environmental uh, conditions have shifted due to stay at home? He'll be going through some of those. Uh, then we'll be moving on to the Partners for a Clean Environment and Zach Swank, their business um, sustainability coordinator, will be talking about the different things that businesses could be doing during closures and also these periods as we're moving from stay at home to safer at home and moving out and resuming business. And then we have David Henry, who's the uh, co-owner and founder of um, and general manager of Namaste Solar, talking about how they've operated. Not only are they a business that, uh, you know, fits the Earth Day theme and operating in alternative energy and environmental sustainability. But Namaste has navigated through these times uh, based on their uh, values, cultural values of their organization, how they've operated and have to navigate through. He'll be explaining some of those. And then our partners at Boulder Transportation Connections, Joan Lyons was someone that uh, helped pull together a um, webinar with us right off the bat to talk to businesses about how to telework in the very first week of these closures. Joan is back today to talk about the behavioral changes that we've seen and the analysis that they've done. So uh, getting to our presentations today, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Silverstein, the Executive Director of the Regional Air Quality Council, and I will let Mike share his screen and um, present his material. So Mike, it's on okay, you. Go ahead. Getting my slides up here. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And there we go as well. And I'm, I'm pleased and, and honored to speak with all of you. Uh, this is a strange time we are living in and working in. But it's a time to plan ahead as well and continue the good work we have been doing for air quality and to make those necessary improvements 
down the road. We've learned that COVID, uh, the disease, is especially hard on folks with pre-existing uh, respiratory conditions. And air quality only exacerbates Looks like, did we lose Mike? Oh, we lost Mike. Okay, um, that's unfortunate, but why don't we go ahead and move to Zach Swank. And if we get Mike back, we'll resume with Mike's um, presentation. Uh, Mike was going to cover the um, aspects of what we're seeing in the environment, but Zach from Partners for a Clean Environment will go through what the uh, different businesses can be doing right now and what they can be think about doing coming out of stay at home. So Zach, we'll turn it over to you. Great, thanks Andrea. So PACE is Boulder County's one-stop shop for business sustainability. We offer free expert advisors to assist with energy efficiency, <coughs> waste reduction, water efficiency, and transportation, as well as a certification and rebate and incentive program. But I wanted to start talking off, I started off talking a little bit about COVID-19's impact on carbon pollution. And this is a chart from Carbon Brief uh, that shows they're projecting a 5.5% decrease in carbon pollution this year uh, compared to uh, what was our otherwise trajectory. And there's a couple of different things to note here. One, uh, that's notable. It's the largest we've seen uh, in, in, as far as I know, uh, forever. Um, and also the other thing to note is that it is still not enough. Uh, we need a 7.6% decrease to be in line with the goal of a 1.5 degree temperature rise. So I want to be real clear that uh, COVID-19 is not a climate solution. You know, a pandemic with mass deaths and shutting down our economy is not how we want to approach uh, addressing climate change. However, it is uh, an illustration of the scale of change that we need uh, to, to adequately address climate change. And certainly we can achieve, you know, even better climate pollution reduction results in a more thoughtful way uh, that does not bring our lives and economy to a halt. Another thing I wanted to talk about is mitigation and resilience trans transfer. And what do I mean by that? What helps in one crisis helps in another. So local supply chains you know, are really critical and important now. Um, also helps for climate change. Teleworking, working remote, as well as not traveling to conferences, but doing that remotely also helps for climate change. Walking, biking, uh, cheap solar energy, as I'm sure Namaste is gonna talk about utility cost savings, energy bill savings. Uh, all of those are both things that are helpful in our current pandemic crisis, as well as the long-term climate crisis. And so, you know, what helps mitigate one problem also helps mitigate other problems. But a couple of things we need to watch out for are rollbacks of important uh, environmental regulations, as well as, you know, as we saw from that previous chart, we're going to have a little. We're going to have a little climate, you know, pollution uh, reduction bump uh, from COVID. Uh, again, not the way that we want to achieve that, um, but it's going to happen. But it's still not enough, and we still need policy. But thinking more locally uh, and for specific businesses here, what are some things you can do now um, that both help your resilience to the economic impacts of COVID? Uh, and the health impacts of COVID, as well as uh, long-term impacts of climate change. You know, first, you know, if you've got, as, as I'm sure, you know, just about everybody does, an empty office, uh, make sure that your set points are set back so you're not heating an empty office unnecessarily. Uh, it saves you on your utility bills. It also saves you on your pollution that you're putting out uh, in terms of carbon dioxide. Flipping off the lights, uh, yeah, it's a no-brainer, um, but may not be top of mind for everyone right now. Uh, there are, of course, uh, lots of other things uh, to be concerned about, so just wanted to throw that one in there. Um, 
and then plug loads. So a lot of equipment we use is what's called phantom power, which is even in the off setting, it still has a small draw. If you know you're not going to be using that equipment for a period of time, uh, flip off the switch or, or unplug it. And then if you're really certain that you're going to have vacancy uh, in your building for a while, you can even turn back your hot water temperature settings. One other device that helps with double benefits for both uh, mitigating um, COVID and also climate change is an economizer. And an economizer is a simple device that goes on your outside uh, air handler unit for your heating and cooling. And what it does is when you're in cooling mode, so it's hot, you know, you want to, you want to, it's hot inside and you want to cool it down. There are certain times of the day and certain times of the year, um, now being one of them, uh, when it's cooler outside, you know, in the morning and the evenings than it is inside. And so rather than running your air conditioner, you know, at full speed, an economizer brings in that cool outside air. Uh, so it's able to tell the temperature difference between inside and outside and then automatically bring that in rather than just recirculating the, the interior air, uh, which of, of course, you know, bringing in more fresh air is one of the solid recommendations as we all start to return back to our offices. An economizer is also something that uh, PACE uh, has rebates for. Um, and in fact, we have rebates for just about every type of equipment that uses electricity, whether it's lighting, heating and cooling, uh, food service equipment, uh, renewable energy, or electrical vehicle charging. And on the electrical vehicle charging side right, right now, um, the Regional Air Quality Council uh, is accepting uh, applications for the Charge Ahead program and Excel Energy has a new program where they will help with the infrastructure costs, so bringing power to the location where you want to charge your vehicle. Uh, so contact us if, you, if that at all interests you, because those two programs combined can significantly, significantly reduce the cost of installing electric vehicle charging. Uh, the other note is that our rebates and incentives can be combined with the utility incentives, so you get to double down. You know, if you've got a piece of equipment that's failing, uh, needing the end of its life, uh, you know, you have, can't imagine how you're going to be able to uh, cover those costs now uh, with everything that's going on with the economy. Uh, reach out to us uh, and we will help you look at what an efficient option is and then what incentives you can get both from us and from your utility. And that's all. Uh, you can find us at pacepartners.com and happy to take any comments or questions uh, when that time comes around. Thank you, Zach. Um, we appreciate your input and, and what businesses could be doing uh, at this time. And, um, and then also, you know, folks have opportunity or questions about any opportunities that will exist for these companies uh, as we go out. Zach is also working with Boulder County's uh, emergency response team. And so he knows of those opportunities that businesses can qualify for, uh, not only for um, environmental sustainability upgrades or, or things like that, just in general. So feel free when we get into the Q&A to submit those questions and we'd be glad to, uh, to pose them to Zach. So we do not have Mike Silverstein back from the Regional Air Quality Council yet. He uh, messaged me that he lost his Wi-Fi. Um, unfortunately, that's just some of the things that can go wrong on a webinar, but we are um, glad to have David Henry here. He is the co-owner and general manager of Namaste Solar. And Namaste has really navigated these challenges through this time to continue operations as a solar company, um, not only in, in the service they provide, but how they operate as a company. David's um, agreed to be on here today to share some of those lessons learned with all of you. So with that being said, David, thank you for being here today and um, we'll turn it over to you. Great, can you hear me okay? Thank you, Andrea. Um, thank you to the Chamber for, for having us, inviting us to participate in this. Um, name is David Henry. I'm a, one of many co-owners of Namaste Solar and happen to be the general manager as well. Been with the company since 2007 and um, have had a, uh, uh, been very fortunate to <clears throat> largely spend most of my career working in renewable energy and particularly solar. I thought today um, I would just give a quick overview of, of Namaste Solar. Um, kind of how we're structured, some of the things that are important to us and how we've really relied on who we are and how we operate to help us navigate the, 
the radical uncertainty of the current landscape of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, so as most of you probably know, uh, just from our name, we are a, a local solar company based in Boulder in Denver, Colorado. Um, we started many years ago by, by uh, developing our mission statement. And essentially, you know, this is really kind of a guiding principle for us in, in many of our businesses, decision making that we have as a business. Um, so we, we work to propagate the responsible use of solar energy, pioneer conscientious business practices, and create a holistic wealth for ourselves and our community. Um, so being a strong uh, member of our community and considering the community and environmental stakeholders, something that's long been a core principle and tenant for Namaste Solar. The principle, the three principal areas where we operate are in residential solar. So we design and install residential solar systems um, primarily up and down the front range from Fort Collins down to the southern part of Denver and everywhere in between. We also have a, a fairly substantial commercial program um, where we do everything from design and install fairly sizable commercial projects, community solar gardens, um, and, and smaller uh, commercial and industrial uh, systems for, for business owners in our local community. And we also have a strong operations and maintenance department that goes around and services existing systems throughout the state to make sure that they're operating at their full capacity and that whoever owns these systems is, is maximizing their return on their investment that they made. And then the third leg of our stool is essentially a design and engineering program that we have where we do um, provide services for commercial projects as well as a number of different residential projects and partners that could use um, our design and engineering help. While our residential and commercial installations and projects are primarily focused in Colorado, we provide design and engineering services throughout the country um, and have designed a number of systems from everywhere from Florida to the northeastern U.S. all the way up to Alaska and everywhere in between. And the great thing about this diversification is this has allowed us and supported us in helping navigate some of the, the limitations on being able to work out in the field from a health and safety perspective. A um, couple of key things that are important to highlight is our organizational structure. We're an employee-owned cooperative. We have about 170 people total in our company at this point, and a little more than 100 of which are, are actual co-owners of the company meaning they've each invested some of their own money into being part owner and are helping make many of the decisions that we make as a business um, and to help us uh, run our business in, in an effective way. We're a certified B Corporation and we're also a public benefit corporation. Um, most of you are probably aware of, of what the implications of these things are, but essentially, um, being a public benefit corporation, we've committed to a requirement that we're gonna contemplate the needs of a variety of stakeholders, including our community and, and the environment when we're making all of our business decisions. So being a certified B Corp and a public benefit corporation means we're committed to more than just profit for the sake of profit. Um, we're trying to continue to make profit so we can continue to exist to benefit our community and continue to be a strong stakeholder in our community and help support those other stakeholders. Um, Pillars of co-ownership, this is something, an idea that we developed long ago when we were thinking about how pillars can be the foundational structure and, and really support the stability of a building. Um, we came to this conclusion about that we need pillars of co-ownership, something that our company can kind of be built on that we can use as a stabilizing force. So there's three pillars of co-ownership. One is cooperative ownership, meaning a principle for us is that it's important that our business is owned by the people that work here uh, and that we cooperate as a group to, to run our business and make many of our business decisions. Democratic decision making. Um, this is something that's really important. Uh, we try to minimize a lot of top down decision making. There are certainly cases where that is necessary, but largely many of the really big picture important decisions around the company um, we handle and through a democratic decision making process which is often done through the voting um, of co-ownership, things like that. But it's really important that we make sure that at a minimum, all voices have a place to be heard. And the last pillar of co-ownership is extreme transparency. 
This means that we're transparent with the owners of our company um, on all matters, except for anything that might be uh, uh, a legally protected matter, you know, some HR issues, things of that nature. But all of our financials are transparent, uh, how our decisions are made, if you aren't involved in a certain decision, um, there's expected to be transparency uh, of how we arrived at certain decisions, who made them, and, and providing some rationale as to why those decisions were made. Um, and as a co-owner, you know, we want people to have that ownership experience and be informed about um, why certain decisions are made in our company. And this has long been a, a, a core principle um, and pillar of co-ownership for our company. Our core values, and, and you'll see in a moment why it's important for me to highlight all of these. I won't, I won't provide definitions for each of these, but we have a long list of core values that are um, really the, the lens with which we guide many of our business decisions in the company. Accountability, distributed leadership. You know, Distributed leadership implies that there's leadership in every level of the organization and every job role of the organization. Safety is incredibly important, and this isn't just physical safety for those that are working in the field. This is the health and mental safety of those in the office, um, and especially in a time during COVID, um, it's critically important that we have awareness around that. Co-ownership mentality. We want people in our company to feel empowered to make decisions as if they, you know, as an owner of the company and embrace that ownership mentality when they're making decisions, not not purely as I'm an employee, but I'm an owner of this company and how does that impact my decision making? Holistic perspective. We want people and we want all of us to try to account for multiple perspectives and try to see the bigger picture and how a decision in one area might impact um, other people in other areas that we might not always be fully aware of. So we try to remind ourselves to carry a holistic perspective. Frank Open and Honest Communication or FOH for short, this is something we're constantly striving for. Um, it's very difficult to be frank, open, and honest. And it's not always necessarily a need when situations are difficult or you have to provide difficult feedback, but it's also important to have this when you're providing positive and, 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 and really reinforcing feedback to people when they've done a good job as well. Fun. We try to have as much fun as possible and we happen to have a very fun community um, a lot of our communications are fun. And even though we deal with real serious problems and stressful situations, we try to, to find humor in many of the situations. Um, and we try to really enjoy, create an environment where we enjoy working with the people around us. Stakeholder balancing is, is also really critical. Um, not only thinking of our company, but what other stakeholders are, are, are gonna be principally impacted by any decisions. That includes customers, the environment, our community, um, any of our other partners, vendors, um, any of those types of people that have a stake in how we're running our business. And lastly, uh, but not least, long-term thinking. Um, this is something that's been critical for us to not always lose sight of the long-term when we're having to make short-term decisions. So navigating the COVID crisis, um, how, is, how have we as a company been navigating this COVID crisis? When, when it first started becoming clear um, that this was a problem that was going to directly impact us in Colorado, as well as our country, in particular us as Namaste Solar, um, our leadership got together and made an intentional decision that we have to very proactively lean into and trust our mission, our pillars, our core values, and we have to really trust in the organizational culture and the structure that we have at Namaste Solar. And we have to use those things to help guide us and help our decision making as we're navigating uh, what has been a lot of stressful and very difficult decisions and trying to make sure that we have a company that comes out the other side of this. So how has our mission helped us? Um, of everything in our mission statement, the, the pioneering of conscientious business practices has been kind of crucial. We wanted to remain conscientious as we've made all of these business decisions and impacts around COVID. If we're having to contemplate a reduction in our workforce or how are we gonna continue to work safely in certain situations? How do, we, how do we do this in a conscientious way? So this has been a principal guiding light for us as we've had to make difficult decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. We've also had to evolve our three pillars of co-ownership. Not a lot changed in terms of the cooperative ownership pillar, 
But democratic decision making, because of the rapid nature and the uncertainty and, and the speed with which we had to make decisions, we had to temporarily talk with our cooperative and our coners and inform them that we need to rely on our leadership team, our task force. We, we established a task force, which happened to be a core of six people that are the principal leadership of Namaste Solar. And we, we committed to working transparently, but we also committed that this group needed to be empowered to make decisions. And so we had conversation to set those expectations with the, with the company as a whole. And we had a lot of support from the organization that, that we didn't have a lot of time and energy to bring everybody in the company along on the journey of every one of these decisions that were really impactful, but needed to happen very quickly. Extreme transparency. We also had to evolve this a little bit in a temporary fashion to what we now call delayed transparency. <clears throat> we needed to be able to have the company trust that the leaders would get together and talk about some really difficult topics and um, explore a number of options before arriving at decisions and that we were committed to still being transparent about those decisions, but we just weren't feeling like we could do it in real time without it potentially having some real negative impacts if people were only hearing bits and pieces of information and then drawing conclusions. Um, again, we had a lot of support from uh, our company to, to operate in this way with the understanding that this wasn't a permanent shift in how we're gonna operate going into the future. And then the core values. We really have, with every decision, we've used every, almost every one of our core values. Fun wasn't necessarily one that was a lens that we used a lot for, for navigating the COVID crisis, but every one of these other um, core values was very much used as a lens for how we were making decisions. You know, accountability, we knew that as leaders, we were gonna be held accountable to any of the decisions that, that we were gonna be made by the co-ownership of the company. We had to rely on distributed leadership. We needed to rely on leaders all throughout our company to give us information, help us make decisions and collaborate on some really difficult decisions about our path forward. Um, safety, this was one of the, the highest profile core values that we had to rely on. Not only safety for our installers who were working in the field, we didn't want them to have a higher risk of exposure. We also were concerned about our customers. We were also concerned about operating the community. We didn't want to contribute to anybody getting sick or increase people's risk profiles. Um, there's also the emotional and, and mental health component of, of stay at home and navigating the COVID crisis. So people are dealing with this on not only a personal level, but also a professional level. And so we have to keep this in mind and practice a lot of empathy and make and create a safe environment for people to express how they're feeling and try to provide resources for people if they're having a difficult time. Co-ownership mentality, similar as before, we need people to be arriving and understanding the decisions from a co-ownership perspective, not necessarily as just an employee. And so a lot of people have understood the difficult decisions that have had to be made. Um, we've tried to carry a holistic perspective and the impacts of our decisions on a variety of, of stakeholders. Same with the stakeholder balancing. Um, we've committed to being very frank, open and honest when we're com communicating with the all company. We've had several all company meetings where our CEO has talked openly about what our next steps are, what we're facing. Are we headed towards layoffs or furloughs? We've had very um, upfront conversations about those things um, and it's been very, very valuable for us. And then all the while, never losing sight of our long-term thinking. So how are we gonna make sure that we have a business on the other side of this? How do we make decisions now that aren't gonna hurt us when we try to come out the other side of this? So not rushing to judgment and laying everybody off, how do we decide um, what the right middle ground is to make sure that we're set up for success in the long run? And then lastly, how's our organizational structure and culture helped us during this crisis? Well, Really, the very nature of being a B Corp and a public benefit corporation, you know, we're well versed in contemplating um, our holistic impacts, our holistic decision making, um, evaluating our impacts on the environment and, and trying to do the delicate dance of stakeholder balancing. So the very notion that we're committed to good social impacts, environmental impacts and doing business um, as a force for good 
you know, that inherently sets us up well from a strategic perspective to be able to have alignment in how we're navigating this as a business and to not lose sight of those things. And we can rely on other partners that are benefit corporations or B Corps and, and seek advice and, and draw from that community on advice and, and learn from their perspectives as well. And then the last element is, I would say, our culture of ownership, Namaste Solar's culture of inclusivity, collaboration, and transparency. These are all elements that I think have been absolutely crucial and our company trusting a group of leaders to, to make decisions somewhat isolated from the company, which is, which is a different experience for us, and to trust that we're gonna be transparent and to trust that we will listen to all voices and set up communication channels to hear from everybody about ideas, concerns, have questions, and that we're going to report back regularly. And I think absent of those things, I think it, we would have had a lot more culture of fear um, distrust and um, not a lot of support. Um, the support that we've had from our company as leaders has been absolutely phenomenal, phenomenal and incredibly rewarding. Um, people understand that we've had to make bad, or not bad, but difficult decisions. And in many cases, there are different degrees of bad decisions that we've had to make, um, not being in love with any of the outcomes. And we've had so much support from the people that work at Namaste Solar to make those decisions and an understanding that they are very difficult, but yet they need to happen. So I think all of those things, leaning into our core values, relying on our mission, um, trusting in the culture of our company and who we are and the people that work here, these are the things that have really helped us inform and make some really difficult decisions as we navigate this. And Namaste Solar is in a, right now currently in a, in a pretty good position for the next two months and depending on what happens in the marketplace we are hopeful that we can continue to serve our community in installing solar and helping people have more control over their electricity and utility costs and generate electricity from their own pv systems on their homes or their businesses and ultimately help them have better control over their utility costs so thank you for letting me share our story um, I will turn it back over to Andrea and uh, be happy to answer any questions uh, when the time is right. All right. Thank you, David. Um, if you turn off your screen share, we have Mike Silverstein from the uh, Regional Air Quality Council back. Mike is ready to uh, share his screens. He had a little bit of a Wi-Fi disconnect a moment ago. Um, but he's back and we are glad to have him back. Thank you, Mike, for scrambling back to us. Um, we want to just highlight for everyone what is going on with the environmental air quality we're seeing now. What are we learning in this? And just some simple steps to getting back to what we could be doing, getting out of uh, stay at home. And um, we are running a little bit behind schedule. So we're going to try to get through the next two panelists. Uh, which also include uh, Boulder Transportation Connections. And then if we don't have time for questions, folks, please pose them anyway, and we will get back to those that are asking questions of our panelists. But hopefully we have time for um, just one or two at the end of this. And again, this will be recorded and sent out uh, to everybody on this webinar. So with that being said, Mike, turn it over to you. Thanks for coming back. Okay, Andrea, and, and thank you all for your patience. I uh, have some Wi-Fi hiccups here, and it's still it's giving me some poor signals, so hopefully this will last for another six, seven minutes. Um, happy Earth Day, everyone, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the Regional Air Quality Council, what we do, and our air quality situation and status. So let me begin here. Uh, the Regional Air Quality Council is the lead air quality planning agency for the Front Range region. We are non-attainment for the pollutants of ozone, but this is a summertime air quality issue that we are trying to address and get the area to an attainment status. In other words, have good, healthy air for all of us. Uh, our office is predominantly focused on air quality planning and technical analysis, so working with all stakeholders to figure out the right way to address the air quality issues of our region and come up with plans and approaches that are technically and scientifically based 
uh, with good economics so that we can bring the area into compliance with federal standards. We also have incentive programs that actually reduce emissions. So we're looking at uh, our resources, especially in this difficult time, and continuing our efforts to uh, come up with monies that we can fund incentive programs for vehicles, uh, both uh, light duty and heavy duty vehicles, like school buses and, and transport vehicles and large industrial equipment, as well as lawn and garden sources, so that we can uh, improve our emission situation. Looking at uh, vehicle electrification is a primary focus of the Regional Air Quality Council now and the state of Colorado. We also have a, a robust public education and outreach program and we're taking opportunities like uh, we have today to let you all know what we do and how we can re better reach our business leaders and the general public with our education materials and our outreach messages to make improvements. Uh, the Denver region is out of compliance with the federal open standard, as I mentioned, and we have been recently reclassified as a serious non-attainment area for ground level ozone. And so we have lots of air quality issues uh, with us, but ozone is front and center for the Regional Air Quality Council and transportation is a big part of the uh, mission category that we are trying to address so we can gain reductions in the mobile source fleet emissions so that we can better attain air quality standards. This is a trend line that shows how we're doing with ozone. We are better than we used to be. So uh, contrary to what we may have read, our air quality has improved over time. Even though we've been downgraded to serious, we are actually experiencing better air quality than we used to have. So you see how the, the general trend is in a downward fashion and in a good direction, but we're not there yet. We're out of compliance with two federal standards, one that was adopted in 2008 and another in 2015. So our goal at the Regional Air Quality Council is to get these recent values um, towards the 2008 standard of 75 parts per billion and then make progress to achieve the 2015 standard. This is the latest air quality health safety standard of 70 parts per billion by 2023. So not a lot of time to do this work, but a real high priority for the state so that we can improve air quality in a short amount of time and get out of this non-attainment situation that we're in. So the RAC is working to meet these standards through developing control strategies to reduce emissions. We are evaluating a number of strategies that are focused on um, either improving our incentive program, what we call our clean air fund, so that we can electrify the transportation network. We can uh, replace gas powered lawn and garden equipment with electric equipment, clean, burn, clean emission uh, equipment out there. And then we are looking at um, the vehicle fleet, how we can reduce tailpipe emissions, whether it's from better inspection and maintenance of vehicles or the fuel formulations that are uh, used in our vehicles, both gasoline and diesel vehicles. And we're also looking at employer-based trip reduction programs. And this is really important that we look at the, the commuting public, the, the business trips that occur on a regular basis and how we can gain emission reduction. We're now in this great experiment of working from home we're all telecommuting more than we ever thought we would. And we'd like to see these kind of activities continue as regular practice in the business community. So we're working to develop a great outreach and education program with our partners that are already doing this work to ramp those efforts up and to look at other things we can do for um, employers to better reduce trips from their employees, whether it's commuting or um, in the business day. So our Charge Ahead Colorado program is our EV electrification program for get, get the, um, the motoring public where we can get EV charging infrastructure, those charging stations in strategic places where if you go electric with your vehicle, you have confidence that you can get a charge whenever you need that charge. Our Alt Fuels Colorado program is looking at those heavy duty vehicles, mostly diesel vehicles to convert to electric equipment, such as uh, school buses, and uh, delivery vehicles and even heavy duty vehicles to go electric. Our mow down pollution program, again, is this lawn and garden incentive program so we can retire the old gas powered mowers, get electric mowers out there on the lawn and have zero emissions. 
And then our simple steps that our AIR program is our education outreach activity. So we can get the, uh, the public to do more to reduce emissions and again, looking at the business community to participate at a greater level. So we're an employer-based trip reduction program. We want to focus on that because that is a, a part of our Lunch and Learn series today where we want to develop this intensive outreach to business and government agencies for immediate and long-term voluntary commuter and business trip reduction efforts. So we have programs out there now from the Denver Regional Council of Governments and our Transportation Management Association to, to reach the business community to find ways to reduce those trips. So we want to better support those efforts and reach the business community any way we can to get long-term participation in our voluntary programs. But we've also been tasked with developing a regulatory approach if that's needed and necessary. Because if we don't achieve air quality standards, the 75 per billion standard I mentioned, we would be reclassified again to an even more severe classification. And then this would be mandatory. So we want to avoid that, but we have to plan ahead to figure out the best approach uh, that would be uh, easy to comply with and, and effective in reducing emissions from the, uh, the vehicle fleet related to uh, business activity. So we're all in this together. We hope we don't go serious or, excuse me, severe because we're serious already and we want to get to attainment of those air quality standards. We have programs out there. I won't go into a great deal of detail. We're under a short time uh, here, but we have pilots out there that have been uh, underway for uh, for a year or two now, where large companies, in this case, Department of Health and Environment in, in Central Denver, working with their employees to reduce those trips. And they've gained great success in a structured program. And we'd like to share that with anyone who's interested um, in a similar program for your business. So lots of activity, lots of opportunity to reduce those vehicle trips. Um, simple steps that are air moving forward. We want to continue those efforts to get folks out of their cars. Uh, skipping a trip uh, or two trips each week is really important. That whether it's a commute trip or an errand or a, a pleasure uh, activity, if we can get folks to reduce their driving, we'll make great progress. Teleworking is, is front and center of what, we're, what we need to emphasize in these next few years to reduce those emissions. Combining car trips, combining passenger trips, whether they're um, in our errands or in carpools and van pools, taking public transport. I know that uh, it's going to be tough getting on the, the trains and buses with our neighbors under this COVID scare, but we need to move uh, forward and hopefully we'll find safe public transportation that benefits us all from a, from a health perspective. We need to um, go with those low and zero emission vehicles, those new electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles that that reduce emissions substantially from our vehicle fleet. And they're not just passenger cars. We're looking at SUVs and, and in the future pickup trucks and heavy duty equipment like buses and delivery vehicles and even construction equipment going electric. Going um, after those emissions in the in the yard and uh, in when we care for our whether it's our lawns at home or the big office park, golf courses. Uh, anywhere we see large stretches of grass, we need to go electric with that lawn and garden equipment. We need to uh, encourage folks to fill up after five so we don't get those emissions from filling up uh, our gas tank for those that are using gasoline, which are most of us, and mowing after five to get those emissions out of the air when they are important so they don't form ozone in those hot sun days. We have tools to track progress. And those are listed here. And I know this um, slide will be up on the website for your further use. So we have so much going on at the Regional Air Quality Council that is improving air quality, but we need to do more to meet those standards. Lots of uh, information packed onto one slide here, and I, I hope this is helpful for all of you. Here is our contact information at the RAC. Happy to work with all of you in the business community to find ways to reduce those emissions and look at those innovative strategies that we haven't thought of yet, inviting you all to our stakeholder committees where we look at new strategies and look at the pros and cons of things to try to figure out the best way to, to move forward to and improve their quality. So we'll leave you all with that. Uh, our, you know, our good contact information here online and um, love to entertain questions when the time is right. 
All right, thank you, Mike. Um, Mike, if you want to uh, unshare your screen, we're gonna go ahead and move to Joan Lyons from Boulder Transportation Connections. And um, again, like I mentioned at, at the beginning, Joan has been um, a partner with us in an early webinar we did uh, in the very first week of closures to educate our businesses, to provide some kind of assistance in how to telework. Now that we're sure everybody's a, a pro at teleworking, having been forced into this situation, um, we're realizing and learning new aspects of, of what this all means. And Joan is back to talk about what we're seeing in teleworking now, uh, behavior change and the analysis and, and what this can mean for coming out of that. Um, before I turn it over to Joan, I just do wanna mention that we are uh, gonna be cutting it close on time. So we may be going a little over. Uh, for anybody that has to drop off at 12.30, uh, we thank you for joining us. We're gonna let Joan get through her presentation. And if there's any questions, we'll uh, go ahead and look at those and see what they are. But again, thanks everybody for being on here today. Uh, Joan, why don't you go ahead? And then after that, we'll see what kind of questions we have. Thanks, Joan. Yeah, thanks so much, Andrea. And hopefully I can engage you guys just for a little bit longer. I don't have too long of a presentation. I've worked on this, getting it very tight, very uh, frequently throughout the past couple of days. So hopefully for the next eight minutes, I can engage you in some data and analysis that various different organizations throughout the Denver Metro region have been gathering, like the Denver Regional Council of Governments, us, BTC, as well as Google. So to give you a little bit of a background of what we do at BTC, we're a nonprofit organization that works for the city of Boulder. Um, and we work with tons of different groups of individuals that work or live in the region. And we also help people not work uh, at their physical office space. So what that means is we help people with teleworking. And as Andrea mentioned, we do have a teleworking webinar that we conducted with the chamber a couple of weeks ago to talk about how to set up those policies and programs. And we'll have one of my staff members just link that in the chat, just in case you missed it. But I think it's important for us to think about how teleworking has changed drastically over the past couple of months. Four months ago was very different from what we're experiencing now. That's very traditional. And this is teleworking in a pandemic. And we're changing a lot of our behavior and the way that we move around as well. And according to Google's mobility changes report to address changes in commuting in response to social distancing guidelines related to COVID-19, there are drastic ways that people in Boulder County are changing the way that we're commuting. We're seeing a 53% reduction of traffic to restaurants, shopping centers, museums, libraries, movie theaters, and we're seeing a huge reduction of traffic also to transit. I love transit, we promote transit at our organization, but right now it's just not really the safest thing to use. And we're also seeing an increase of traffic to public parks, gardens in Boulder, and you know, we obviously see this. You know, we're exercising outside, we're seeing this very regularly. And of course, because we're all teleworking from home, we're seeing a huge reduction of people going into their work places or offices and that means that we've also seen a dramatic shift in the commute. Most people a year ago around this time in March, only 6% of the people in the region were actually working remotely. Now we're seeing a percentage at 86%. And so that means that we're having a drastic increase of inexperienced teleworkers. And that's huge. But at the same time, we have a lot of teleworkers who are satisfied with working remotely. And I think that that's something to really celebrate on a day like today because it's Earth Day. You know, we have all this time and effort that we've been putting into teleworking and working from home. And this has huge impacts to our carbon reduction that we have in, on an individual level, but also on an organizational level. And teleworkers are reporting such a better work-life balance from working from home, even given these circumstances. And you can see some of the benefits here, trying to you know, spend some time to get you all on track for time here, so I won't be spending too much time on some of these slides. But while most people are satisfied, those that are satisfied are experiencing challenges when it comes to COVID-19. And a lot of that's really with anxiousness, with the pandemic, job security, company health. And you know, there are ways that you can help your organization 
and your employees address these challenges now by providing these types of materials. These are things that BTC can do or you can do on your own. And I think that it's obviously worth recognizing. And many of you are on this webinar likely because you care about the environment, it's of interest to you, and that's why you join us today. And at some point, we're going to have the ability to leave our homes, and that likely is going to be in the foreseeable future, as Jared Polis has been mentioning. And that's why it's my job to get people excited about the environment and the impact that we make on it. I think it's important for us to think harder and smarter about how we change commuter behavior in the wake of a disruption, like the state we're in currently. But also think about what it looks like on an Earth Day scenario. Behavioral scientists study exactly this. How can we make decisions in real life? And that data reflects that timing matters. Behavioral scientists tell us that the best time to start and act and change is during the time of a fresh start. So a new year when we develop New Year's resolutions for the year or a disruption like when we're moving homes or offices. And it's no question that we've been given a disruption during our crisis that we're facing. But it also gives us a fresh start to try new things and get people excited about the ways that we interact with one another. And now is the time to change the way that we commute in order to look at our individual commute behaviors. As an example, this is my normal commute reflected here. I will likely be riding my bike a lot more and I'll be walking a lot more and ultimately using a lot more micro mobility. And on the days when I choose to commute, that's what I'll do. But certainly I'm going to be making a huge shift in remote work. Our organization normally does work remotely, but I think that things will definitely be shifting a lot more where we're going to be spending a lot more time in our homes. But I think it's important to note that the average business in the city of Boulder is about 20 employees. And that average of one to two days of working from home or working remotely, you'll save 197 hours annually by just working from home those one to two days. And that's huge for your business, your carbon footprint, and your individual commute and stress that you're going to incur. And a lot of these people that are within our region really do want to have a mix of remote work and commuting. And given the choice, most people would choose to work from home one to two days per week after business returns to normal. And I think that's important for businesses to recognize as we continue forward. And there are ways that you should start helping your employees for teleworking tomorrow. There's going to be the opportunity for us to continue to life as normal, but I don't think that life is actually going to be as normal as we all think. Um, we're going to have to provide remote work equipment to individuals and maybe it makes sense for people like Mike who, you know, don't have great internet sometimes to have their organization pay for at home internet connectivity and um, subsidize some of those costs so that people can actually conduct their work from home every day. And work-life balance is huge in this process too. So try and offer these benefits to your organization and to your employees. And with that said, thank you all so much for attending my portion of the webinar. And with our partnership of the Denver Regional Council of Governments and the transportation management organizations that are affiliate organizations of Dr. Cog, we are looking forward to helping your businesses with collecting some of this data that I've presented to you on a collective scale for your organization. And we're here to provide you with any assistance that we can. So thank you so much for attending and I hope you guys enjoyed that. Thank you, Joan and everyone. We are um, up against time. So what we wanna do is just thank you for joining us today. Um, we will go ahead and um, get a link of this webinar out to everybody so that you have the ability to watch it if, if you'd like to share it to go back revisit some of what was presented we'll also be sending out an email to connect you with our panelists today uh we we realize that you know we have some folks dropping off right now um we thank you so much for joining us over your lunch hour and we want to connect you to the folks that delivered the information today david henry from namaste solar Mike Silverstein and the Regional Air Quality Council, uh, Joan Lyons at Boulder Transportation Connections, and Zach Swank at PACE, Partners for a Clean Environment. All these folks know the different resources in which you can tap into. 
uh, David can share his perspective on what you can do as a company and managing your staff, working with them. All, all of what has been shared today, hopefully has been incredibly helpful and informational for you. And again, we can't do this without the, the help of our sponsors and their support. Google, WW Reynolds, the Zayo Group, and BTC, thank you for, for everything you've done for us. And to all of you out there, have a happy Earth Day. Do something that celebrates uh, the environment. Thanks for joining. And to all our panelists, um, we thank all of you for being here today and, uh, and being a part of this. And um, we hope to, uh, to bring everybody back for another webinar here sponsored by the Boulder Chamber and in partnership with the folks that have joined us today. So with that being said, thank you everyone and uh, have a happy Earth Day.